When our bolus, the small spherical mass of food, actually reaches the lower portion of our esophagus, there is a muscle known as the cardiac sphincter that opens up, relaxes, and allows that food to actually exit the esophagus and enter our stomach. Now, this is our stomach shown in this diagram. And the stomach is a very flexible pouch, a very flexible sac that is the site of mechanical as well as chemical digestion digestion, especially the digestion, the breakdown of proteins into smaller polypeptides. Now, depending on how much food we actually ingest and how much protein is found in that food, the stomach can actually store that food anywhere from several minutes to several hours. For example, if we inject, ingest a lot of food that contains lots of protein, then the stomach will store that food for hours to basically ensure that the food is broken down into smaller components and all the protein is broken down into smaller polypeptides. Now, after our food is broken down into the smaller components and after the protein is broken down to smaller polypeptides, that food exits the stomach and enters our small intestine and we'll focus on the small intestine in the next lecture. Now, within our stomach, we do not have a lot of absorption taking place. So none of the nutrients, the protein, the carbohydrates, and the lipids are actually absorbed in our stomach. What is absorbed are molecules such as caffeine, alcohol, and aspirin, and other molecules. Now, if we examine the walls of our stomach, the walls of the stomach contain a lining that contains millions of exocrine glands. And two types of exocrine glands found in the stomach lining are gastroglands as well as pyloric glands. Now, an exocrine gland is a gland that produces a molecule or a substance and releases that directly into a duct that empties out into our cavity, into the lumen, in this case, the cavity or the lumen of our stomach. So if we zoom in on a small section of the lining, we basically get the following microscopic diagram. So our exocrine glands consist of four important types of cells. We have mucous cells, we have chief cells, parietal cells, and G cells found all the way at the bottom of these ducts of our exocrine glands. Now, adjacent to our ducts, we basically have our capillary system that connects to our blood vessels as well as to our lymph vessels. And these vessels exchange waste products and bring nutrients and oxygen to these cells found on the lining of our stomach and the lining of these exocrine glands. Now, below the blood vessels, we have our muscle. We have a three-layer muscle system that is responsible for contraction of the stomach and that ultimately allows the movement of our food from our uh, stomach along the stomach and into our small intestine. So now let's focus on each one of these four cells and discuss the functionality of these cells. And later we're also going to mention a fifth cell found in our stomach lining, also known as the enterochromaffin-like cell. So let's begin with our mucus cell. So mucus cells are easy to remember because what their function is to secrete a special type of substance known as mucus. Now mucus is a fluid-like substance that consists of glycoprotein, water, electrolytes, so our ions, as well as other molecules. And what the mucus does is it ultimately lubricates our stomach lining and that allows the movement of our fluid along the, of our um, food along that stomach lining. And what it also does, and perhaps the more important function of the mucus, is to basically provide protection to the epithelial cells, the epithelial lining of our stomach. So as we'll see in just a moment, the stomach has a very high acidity, a very low pH, and that can easily destroy the lining of that stomach. And to prevent our epithelial lining from destroying itself as a result of that high acidity, these mucous cells secrete this mucus that protects our epithelial lining from degradation. 
Now, as we see from this diagram, the mucus cells are found on the lining of that stomach and also on the upper portion of our exocrine gland ducts. So let's move on to our chief cells. So chief cells are also pretty easy to remember and that's because chief cells secrete a chief, a principal zymogen of the stomach known as pepsinogen. So these cells, the chief cells, release the principal or chief zymogen of the stomach known as pepsinogen. And once pepsinogen is actually released into our duct and it enters our lumen of the stomach, if the pH is low enough, if the pH is around 2, so if we have a very highly acidic environment, then our pepsinogen will transform into the active form, the active enzyme known as pepsin. And pepsin is that protein, the enzyme, the proteolytic enzyme found in the stomach that is responsible for breaking down the protein into smaller polypeptides. And unlike these mucus cells, the chief cells are found lower within our duct region. So these purple cells are the chief cells. Now let's move on to our parietal cells. So earlier we mentioned that the stomach has a very low pH. So when we have a full stomach and we have digestion taking place, the pH is around 2. The question is why? What creates that low pH? What gives our stomach such a high acidity? So the answer is these parietal cells. Parietal cells are responsible for generating hydrochloric acid and releasing that hydrochloric acid acid into our ducts and ultimately into the lumen of the stomach. So parietal cells produce and secrete hydrochloric acid, HCl, which serves several important purposes. There are four purposes that you have to be familiar with. So by releasing hydrochloric acid, we ultimately decrease the pH and increase the acidity of the lumen of the stomach. And that stimulates our chief cells to release our pepsinogen into our stomach lumen. Secondly, it actually, act, it actually activates our pepsinogen. It transforms it into pepsin, the active form of the enzyme. It also denatures, it breaks down the three-dimensional shape of the protein into its primary sequence to basic and that basically allows our pepsin to actually cleave those bonds and as a result of that low pH that low pH can also kill off our bacterial cells that enter our stomach along with our food now Parietal cells don't only secrete hydrochloric acid, they are also responsible for producing a glycoprotein known as the gastric intrinsic factor. And this intrinsic factor is basically responsible for allowing the small intestine, as we'll see in the next lecture, to basically absorb an important type of vitamin known as B12. And finally, let's move on to our G cells. So the mucus cells are these brown cells, the chief cells are these purple cells, the red cells are the parietal cells, and these blue cells found all the way at the bottom are the G cells. Now G cells are also easy to remember because G cells, as the name implies, release a type of hormone known as gastrin. So G cells are found deep in the exocrine glands of the stomach and release a peptide hormone known as gastrin. And this peptide hormone stimulates our parietal cells to release hydrochloric acid into the stomach lumen. Now, G cells themselves are actually stimulated, uh, stimulated by our acetylcholine molecule. So acetylcholine stimulates the G cells to release gastrin and the peptide hormone, the gastrin, stimulates the parietal cells to basically produce hydrochloric acid. Now, another important type of cell that is found in the lining of the stomach are cells known as enterochromaffin cells or enterochromaffin-like cells. Our enterochromaffin-like cells are responsible for secreting a type of molecule known as histamine. And what histamine does is it also stimulates the parietal cells to release hydrochloric acid. 
So we see two important components, two important molecules stimulate parietal cells. So G cells secrete gastrin, which stimulates parietal cells, and our enterochromaffin-like cells also secrete a molecule known as histamine that also stimulates the parietal cells to release our hydrochloric acid. And then the parietal cells, by releasing the hydrochloric acid, basically stimulate the chief cells to release our pepsinogen, which is then transformed into pepsin as a result of that hydrochloric acid as a result of that uh, relatively low pH. So what can we actually conclude about the functionality and the purpose of our stomach? So we see that in our stomach we have the process of mechanical digestion taking place as a result of that continuous movement of our fluid and the contraction of our smooth muscle in our stomach that allows mechanical digestion to actually take place. So we further break down our food into smaller particles. Now inside our stomach we also break down our macromolecules, we break down the protein into smaller peptides as a result of those proteolytic enzymes specifically the pepsin, the enzyme that cleaves the peptide bonds in our proteins. Inside the stomach we have a very low pH and that denatures our proteins and allows pepsin to actually cleave those bonds. And this hydrochloric acid also basically kills off bacterial cells that enter our cell, that enter our stomach with our food. Now, although our stomach does actually absorb certain types of molecules such as, for example, caffeine, as we mentioned earlier, aspirin, as well as alcohol, it acts mostly in digestion. It doesn't actually absorb the nutrients in the stomach. Where the nutrients are absorbed are in the small intestine, as we'll see in the next lecture. Now, the cells of our stomach basically work together to secrete this gastric juice that consists of many different things. It, con it consists of hydrochloric acid, it consists of these enzymes as well as these other molecules that basically help stimulate the cells to release our gastric juice. And what the gastric juice does is it breaks down our food into smaller molecules and together the mixing of the gastric acid and the food turns the food into a fluid-like substance we call chyme and chyme ultimately eggs the stomach and enters our small intestine and inside the small intestine we have the further breakdown digestion of our food into its constituent molecules and those are ultimately absorbed by the cells of the small intestine.